village of Appleton lies between Elmont and Carlton Place in the community of Mississippi Mills. According to local legend, the village was named for the apple trees that settlers in the 1820s found on the banks of this particular bend of the Mississippi River. Located on the traditional home of the Algonquin people, this part of the Ottawa Valley is now surrounded by farm fields and bounded by split rail fences. Today, Appleton is a quiet community of pretty houses built along the idyllic river. But for well over a century, from the 1820s till the 1980s, the Mississippi River drove a prosperous textile industry. Mills took in raw wool and, using machinery powered by water turbines that harnessed the force of the river, churned out yarn, blankets, and fabric. By the late 1800s, the Mississippi Mills region was a national leader in textile production, and there were mills all over the Ottawa Valley. At its peak, the Appleton Mill employed hundreds of workers and produced hundreds of thousands of yards of material each year. Although the looms fell silent long ago, and the mill fell into disrepair, and then ruin, there are still many people who can remember when the Appleton Mill was full of bustle and business. These are some of their stories. How old were you then when you were working in the mill? And sixteen. You were only sixteen. Mm -hmm. And how long had you been at the mill at that point? We just had to just started to get I guess a year, right? Eh? Yeah. Yeah, because we had been going back and forth. Yeah. Very good year. About a year, yeah. Yeah. yeah they, you know, they liked us because uh, my sister got along good with uh, our, our foreman in the plant. And if they needed a warp or anything at night or needed the water, or we'd go in at 2 o'clock in the morning and help them out. So we had a good relationship with them. And. Uh, we got along good, but she was Gladys was a great talker with the, with uh, Fred. She wouldn't take any guff, but he knew where she stood, where he stood with her. Well, in your particular case, you were the only two girls that could do the job yeah. handing in warps, and they, they knew their business, so they had to cater to these two girls mm -hmm. because they were short-handed. You must remember during the war that eight hours wasn't eight eight hours six. Well, at that time it was ten hours. We never heard of eight hours. It was 10 hours, but the 10 hours would go into 12 hours, 14 hours, 16 hours. I used to work right. I used to work 16, 16 hours, consecutive hours, because we had nobody to take my place. It was a war effort, and, and the war had to be done. The work had to be done. Mm -hmm. And now I was only 16 or 17 years at that time, but we had to get out of school because they they had to keep production. There was boys working in Finley's Foundry, working in Finley's Foundry, making shells and stuff. 16, 17, 8 years out, and, the, and Compensation, they shouldn't have been there in the first place, no. but that's all they had to work with. It was a war effort, and people worked day and night, and for very little, too. Very little. And at that time, they didn't have compensation, they didn't have an unemployment insurance, they didn't, they didn't have any of the benefits then. If you were off sick a day, too bad, you didn't get paid for that day. And no such a thing as a holiday. And you worked Saturdays, too. Saturdays. Six days a week. And if there were and off, well, or during the war, we worked seven days a week. Worked Sunday too, just the same as <clears throat> Saturday was. No different. Right around the clock, pretty well. big income for this area right. and a big income 
kind of, I guess, for your for your grandpa. But uh, those yards of material were shipped out all over Canada to get made into uniforms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, my grandfather had indicated that uh, the textile mills in the Ottawa Valley, and there were mills in Lanark, and there were still mills in Carlton Place, uh, Almont, um, Pembroke, Renf Ever, Renfrew, everywhere. They all were basically churning out as much fabric as they could, which was used for uniform material and blanket material, etc. Uh, Coat felt and perf was still making felts. Um, so it was a, a, a boom time for them, <laughs> and they were they did extremely well on, the, on the, those contracts, mm -hmm. and it just about dominated most of the work. After the war was over, when they were still producing material, was most of it used for clothing for like coats and. Yeah, it was typically, um, it would be for, mostly for, uh, uh, well, coats, yes, but they also did blankets. I mean, I think I still have at home a blanket made by one of the affiliates. Yeah. My uh, grandfather's firm, um, uh, as I said before, a lot of the garment industry was headquartered, at least uh, historically, in Montreal. So most of the selling would be to places like Montreal where it was made into garments. Another thing I wonder if you knew, I'm sure you did, that your dye or Eleanor McMunn mm -hmm. was the first lady dyer in Canada. She probably was because there were very, um, in terms of the, if you want to call it the technical or administrative, there were very, I heard, I mean, she was the only person. I remember Eleanor and uh, uh, she worked, Mel Reynolds worked in the, in the dye processing right. and she worked in the labs and they would mix up all of the various different for the new colors and, and uh, she worked there. She was the only woman working. There were women who worked in the administration, women who right. worked as machine operators, but she was the only woman in that kind of a technical yeah. capacity. And that, that was such a... It was a rarity. A rarity, right. for, and especially for Appleton to have her. But everyone spoke very highly of Elmer. Very so, highly. Yeah. And she came from just outside Elmer, mm -hmm. by Clayton Lane. Yeah. She, they must have been so proud. Mm -hmm. When uh, time started to change and Wool wasn't the commodity needed mm -hmm. as it was back then. Times really changed for the mill. Where did your father and grandfather get the materials then for the well, production? Well, they um, there was a lot of by the I guess by the '60s or very late '50s '60s, the world was sort of shifting away from woolens. I mean, there were still specialists who were making. Um, Wolf, wool for suiting, but they were making, if you want to call them more coarse materials for coating, but the world was sort of starting to shift towards synthetics. And uh, I remember, um, I remember the days as a young kid and the mill would be so hot. I, I worked there in the summer jobs, it was just horrendously hot. And they would have the, all the windows open and the looms would be running and the racket from the looms could be heard for miles. But they knew very well that the, um, that was sort of dying. They, sales in that part were slipping off and they had to get into what they called knitted and synthetics. And the, the mill state still made its own yarns, but they would go and buy their raw, if you want to call it polyester synthetic fi fiber, from various sources, from Montreal. It came from Toronto, Montreal, and it was shipped in. I remember the Taggart trucks were coming into the mill every day, bringing products in and bringing you know, raw materials in and taking products out. But the mill did its own dyeing. As I said, Mel Reynolds, they operated their uh, own, own dyeing and they did their own, made their own yarn and they made their own uh, everything uh, themselves so they could try to keep their costs under control as opposed to buying a lot of finished yarns from various different third party suppliers. The mill used to be super, super busy and had about over maybe over between 200 and 300 employees. Yeah, they ran three shifts and I was just, uh, when I was about 14 I was legally able to work. I got a summer job there in the, uh, uh, new, in the knitting. That was in the new addition to the plant because knitting had taken off and they were making, I guess what you'd call a pile for fake furs and for linings for coats. And it was an extremely busy time of the year because all the manufacturers, the garment makers, wanted to have the fabric in by the end of the summer to get products ready for the fall for the winter market. So the summer months were extremely busy. What is your greatest memory of, of the mill and of your granddad um, or your father? Because... Well, I, I think it's just the whole thing of um, most of us don't 
get an opportunity. Right, right now, the average Canadian works probably in a <clears throat> you know, maybe an administrative role. They work in a retail job, but it's um, being able to see sort of the manufacturing process from the raw materials coming into the finished product coming out the door and all the people who were involved in various stages to, to make it you know a viable enterprise and it was quite um uh, it was just all that the amount of work that went into it of course i participated by having a summer job in the knitting running an operating knitting machines but uh, that um, you could just see sort of a small ottawa valley industry that employed you know all peaks 200 to 300 people and they've suddenly disappeared. And that the sad part is, is that you know they're never going to come back. Right? That's right. And one thing we have to really give the college credit for mm -hmm. too. If there was a slow person that needed a job, mm -hmm. they always found a job. Mm -hmm. One that was simple mm -hmm. that they wouldn't get hurt at. Yeah. But brought employment to that person. Yeah. And they were yeah. always looked up to for that. Yeah, I think because there was, it was I mean, as kids we grew up in a rather unbridled kind of environment, we sort of were encouraged to play and work, but there was more of a um, sort of an internal kind of a uh, welfare where people who basically needed work, someone would give them a job to do, and no one really had great expectations of them, but it would be better to have them working and feeling, um, having a purpose than to be sitting idle. Um, so uh, it was always something for somebody to do. Over the years, when the mill would be busy, um, and if people wanted to buy a house or a car, they never hesitated to go to the office mm -hmm. and ask one of the colleagues for assistance. Mm -hmm. And they always got it because they knew they were wanting something and uh, the colleagues would provide the down payment or... Yeah, it was a... It was a uh, kind of a community where you really, they didn't go very far to look for people. Obviously at the time when my grandfather first started the mill, he needed qualified uh, machinists and loom operators who had experience and brought them over, but they would impart their skills and the other people would pick up. But you you could get help or you know give someone a job so they could go to the bank and say, I've got a job and get a loan. <laughs> you know? That's true. Uh, but uh, I remember when my father, grandfather bought the mill from Caldwell's there were quite a few houses uh, that came with it. They used to be boarding houses for mill operators, so um, they rented them. Uh, if they worked in the mill, they rented them for like a, it was a, a very, very modest amount of rent. It was almost like just they virtually paid the utilities. Mm -hmm. So it was a, a good way for people to get a job and get a place to live as well too. your entrance exam in Carlton Place? Mm -hmm. What year was that? That was 1947. And you were? How old? 14. 14. And I was the only one that passed. Brains. <laughs> and but there was only three in our grade. Yeah, but <laughs> even so. But then high school didn't take place. No. Um, because in those days, uh, you would have had to board in Carlton Place. And there wasn't money for that. My, there was still quite a family at home that my dad had to keep, so there was no going to high school. I missed out on that, and I ended up going to work in the mail when I was 14, in October of, um, of 1947. How were you treated in the mail? As at such a young age. Great, great. Uh, the woman that taught me the, to work on the machine, she'd just come back from her honeymoon and she was just like a mother to me. I couldn't, no, I, I'd have to say great. And great. then most of the men had just returned from the war. Yes. And they looked upon you as no, a kid. <laughs> As a daughter? Or? Well, or maybe a younger sister, mm -hmm. you know. And then uh, the um, Jack Jack Colley and um, uh, the Hopkins boys, 
they got together and formed the Appleton Community Recreational Association and they fixed up the community hall. They built a great big rink for us um, in front of where I live now, mm -hmm. right beside the blacksmith shop. Mm -hmm. um, and it was great. It was great. Up to that point, our fun and games was on the bay, skating mm -hmm. on the bay, and uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> what wage would you have earned at that time? Twenty-eight and a half cents an hour. <laughs> And for how many hours in a day? And then just, well, you work three shifts, so that would eight be eight hours. hours. Then when I went to work at the, the old, low, like what we call the lower mill, that mill, mm -hmm. I, um, we were up to 63 and a half cents an hour then. That's a lot of money. And we, it was, it was. And, uh, yeah. So. Did you have good memories of working at the mill? I would have to say yes. I would have to say yes. Um, the Cauley family, like in those days, we seemed to be like all family. There was people coming in by bus from Current Place and Elmont, but the village folk were still the family, mm -hmm. all family. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, the Cauley family helped out a lot of people that is not known to a lot of people. That's right. They stood behind them. Um, we had a young mother in the village. She was 19, two little ones, and she had leukemia. And her mother worked in the mill, that mill with us. There was no money. Uh, at that time, the um, blood transfusions, you had to pay for them. And there was no way that poor mother had um, money to pay for the blood transfusion and the husband was overly fond of the, the young girl's husband overly fond of the bottle so that sort of left you know but Mr. Colley Sr. Or, uh, organized uh, cars to go down to the city and I was in one of them one and I was on I was 15 at that time but um, and then and he would pay for the gas pay whoever was driving you down and there was always three hours on your pay and or you didn't miss your um, hours that you were away and at that time uh, we worked five days a week from seven in the morning till six at night so we never had to work on a Saturday but we went down on a Saturday, and when I got my pay, there was the three extra hours for Saturday, which I didn't work anyways. But he, I, to save that mother, this is what he did. And there was so many things like that that were done that no one knew about. Mm -hmm. If there was a problem in your family, a death or whatever, there was always things sent to your home you know, mm -hmm. that you wouldn't ordinarily expect from uh, an employer. Mm -hmm. you know. I had one lady tell me that when she was burned out, that uh, she, she had lost everything, and uh, colleagues came to her, replenished her furniture and her clothing, and uh, she said no one ever knew that. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, yeah. no. And I know, um, like some of the men that had worked for them, and if they took ill, um, their paychecks, and I delivered them, so I knew they got their paychecks every week. And they were till they, you know, mm -hmm. passed away. Yeah, because there wasn't no, sick leave. No, and nobody knew that. No, you know. Yeah. Uh, and, and maybe I shouldn't be telling that now. But there again, I mean, no one knew their names or anything, but no, it just... Um, Collie stood behind a lot of mortgages to... Oh, right on. Yeah. And even, they own most of the houses in the village, and um, the rents that those people paid was unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe $5 a, a pay came off your pay for rent. Mm -hmm. 
And they're like beautiful homes. They're still all here in the village. Mm -hmm. but and you had a chance to buy your home too from them if you wanted. And docked off your pay at a minimal well, like amount. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Uh, all in all, your life in Appleton has been fantastic. I would not want to live anywhere else. Anywhere else. I was always out taking pictures of things, buildings and stuff, and now they're coming into play. Yes, and being used to here at the museum. Yes. Your memories are too. Yeah. yeah.